Good evening. I'm Carlo Gabler, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome you to the Irish Cultural Centre's Digital Literary Festival. The centre is based in Hammersmith in London, and for the past 25 years has delivered to its patrons the most diverse and august and marvellous Irish cultural and educational programme outside of Ireland. The festival comprises a, a series, a sequence of interviews featuring some of the most successful writers and authors in contemporary Irish writing, discussing what they write. This evening, I am talking to a writer and broadcaster and I think we can say anthologist. I think that's another term that appears on her CV. Sinead Gleeson. Sinead Gleeson, good evening. Good evening, Carla, how are you? I'm fine and dandy. Nice to see you. You too. I thought I would start by just asking you about you. How you tumbled into the world of the word. How you became a indefatigable, diligent, and uh, consummate reader, consumer of literature. Tell us about that. Um, well, I, personally, like most people, I was a reader when I was very young, a kind of voracious and uh, omnivorous reader. I read all sorts of things, you know, I didn't graduate to the, to the literary stuff till I was maybe a teenager, but I, I, I read from very young. and. As I've written about in Constellations, I spent a lot of time in hospital, a lot of time immobile, so a lot of time pretty bored and pre-internet. So books are an ideal um, filler of the void for that kind of stuff. So I, I, I read an insane amount and I, I, books be kind of sort of like an extra limb. I couldn't imagine going anywhere, not just with one book, but with a backup book in my bag in case I ran out. I was that sort of reader. So I was always interested in books and then I, my, my career ended up in journalism. So a different aspect of words, I guess. But um, and I wrote a little bit about books here and there, but primarily was a, a music writer as you know, music and, and books were the things that sort of kept me going through those teenage years. So I was interested in music. I was interested in books and um, I think in terms of, I started doing reviews and writing bits and pieces again while always still reading um, and the first anthology I edited was, was in 2012, uh, an anthology called Silver Threads of Hope, which was actually Anne Enright suggested me as the editor for that, that. and I hadn't done that but I, I did I read a lot of short stories, I, I had been a fan, I had studied English in college, we studied the short story and I, I thought I'd kind of like the idea of that excavation and I didn't know that that would only be the beginning of many anthologies really so yeah I thought I've always been I think you can't be a, a writer without being a, a reader and again I, I slowly phased the music part and moved more towards the book so it just became whether that was in broadcasting or in in um in terms of being a critic or you know getting these anthologies off the ground so I my, my world the last few years has certainly orbited very specifically around books. Mm. You certainly can't be a writer unless you read because to read is to write in a curious way. Uh, your your childhood home was it a was it full of books? Did you get the books from the library? Uh, I There were some books in the house. Uh, my mother read, but there wouldn't have been very kind of literary stuff in the house. Um, our, my mother was a massive Catherine Cookson fan and I didn't actually read any of those, but my dad was really interested in something that I was really interested in, which was ghost stories and the supernatural. So we had a lot of actual anthologies. I think the first anthologies I ever encountered in my life were probably in the house when I was a kid. So there used to be these Irish tales of terror, Scottish tales of terror, you know, those kind of ones. And I, I, Alfred Hitchcock had a couple, Bar the Doors, Ghostly Gallery, all with brilliant Fontana, you know, spooky sci-fi kind of covers or psychedelic covers even. So I read, I did read a lot of short stories and I did read a lot of that. So, but I always the library. I mean, I remember the library being on crutches and, and walking the, the two miles to the library and the two miles back on the crutches. So, so desperately did I want to get down there. So yeah, I've always been, I was always a library member. I was always in the library and I was never without a book. So there were some in the house and when there wasn't, I was, you know, I'd save up or I was given money. I had an amazing godmother who always bought me books and the two of us used to love uh, going to like Garden Fate sales of work and the first thing we'd make, a, my dad had head for the records and we'd make a beeline for the, uh, for the, the, the book stand. And I always, I love second on bookshops still for that reason, the idea of finding a weird, strange folio. Um, you know, all books are wonderful when you buy them, you bring them home, but there's something about the, the, sort of the second hand and the history and yeah, I love it. You mentioned at the start of the conversation that you were an omnivorous reader. 
you, you mentioned um, Catherine Cookson, for instance, just now, and, and these um, anthologies of Gothic or supernatural stories. And then something happens to people when they read, which is they suddenly become aware of categorization, that there's different kinds of fiction and that some kinds of fiction have more weight or status than other kinds. When and how did that happen to you? Uh, I, I guess, I mean, you get a little bit of it in school in terms of what you're reading. You you know, there's your Shakespeare and drama and then there's the kind of the novels you're reading are a specific kind of novels. I mean, it's very different now where you see, uh, you know, work like people like Lu Louise O'Neill makes it onto the curriculum as it should. But it was a very specific kind of stream, I, I, I think, of literary writing that ended up being on the course in school. Um, I, again, I talk about the anthologies in terms of the, the, the Gus Martin edition of Soundings, which I did in school, which was short stories and or which was poetry, only had one woman in it, which was Emily Dickinson. And that information was put in my back pocket for later on when I started to do the two all female anthologies. Um, so I think maybe when I was a teenager, you start, you, you, you know, you have the Enid Blyton and then you go on to the Agatha Christie or you read some sci-fi, you read gothic and horror and stuff and then you know you get to Wuthering Heights in school and I think then I, it was then you sort of start to do the, I attempted Ulysses the first time I think it was about 16 and um was probably trying to impress somebody and I, I didn't get on that well with it at that point but then I went to the other Joyce you know I went to um Portrait of the Artists and, and Dubliners and read them quite young and I realized but you do you do that one of the things in this book I hope in that there's a for a long time and it's been said to me about other anthologies, not necessarily ones I've edited, that, you know, it tends to be quite literary work that gets into anthologies. And I find that more and more problematic as I, uh, as I continue with this kind of work, that there is, there is a lot of snobbery around about writing. I mean, I say that as somebody who's primarily reads literary fiction or work in translation, it's just what I like to read. I can read everything, but I don't just read work like that. I do read, I hope, more broadly than that. So I think it was probably my teens. And then by the time I studied, English and history at UCD and it, well, at the time I got to that point it was you know it was all about Virginia Woolf that's what it went mm. final year seminar was and I was very much in that camp I think. We should um, um, mention to people watching this podcast that the, this book is uh, your actually technically your fourth anthology The Art of the Glimpse a uh, hundred Irish stories but mm. before we get to it I'd like to talk about the earlier anthologies because i'm quite mm -hmm. curious to know whether anthologizing and you also wrote constellations as well um i'm curious to know if anthologizing is something that one as one does it one changes the way that one organizes the material and makes the choices that one makes tell me about the um first the the long, the long gaze back yeah yeah uh I, again um when did you put that together it was published in 2015 so i was working on it from maybe a year and a half i was asked to think in 2013 to do it so after silver threads of hope had come out which had been published by new island and it, it came about it, it you know what I, I i tell the story i've told it many times and it's one of those things that if it had been a different day or i've been standing in a different part of a room the book might not have happened and the story is that i went out to, to new island to see Owen Purcell, um, who had commissioned Silver Threads of Hope, and we were chatting, and over his shoulder in the room, I spotted an anthology that I love, um, called Cutting the Night in Two, which is edited by the wonderful Evelyn Conlon, uh, a great Monaghan writer, and she had done this anthology in 2001, and I was a young journalist at the time, was given it to review, and I loved it, and what shocked me at the time is I hadn't seen an all-female anthology. I, I know now that they existed, obviously, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, not least because of Arlen House and people like that, Pooh Begg, but um, I hadn't seen one myself and it was, there was 34 writers in it. It was an incredible collection. So this was behind Owen's head. And I said, God, you know, you, I loved that book. You, you really should do another one of those. And he just, without missing a beat, because publishers are very opportunistic, just said, you should do another one of those. And that's how it started. Um, and again, I just started with the idea, you decide what you're going to do. Living writers, dead writers. It was always going to be women as that collection had been cutting the night in two. And you just decide who, who, who's going to be in it. What, are you, what kind of work do you want in a book? So in that case, it was women. So there was a very broad, already a broad kind of uh, ring around what, what was going to be in the book. But it was deciding on how far do you go back? Um, do you go up to the present? Do you commission work? Do you not? 
um, and uh, you know other factors that are also come into it, which they did with this latest book, is that you know it's money. You can't clear every story. You can't find the rights for every story. You can't find the physical text of com some stories. You can't afford some stories. So there's all those factors as well, which is so you you often don't necessarily get the book that you want in the end. But I've been lucky that I've come pretty close with with all of them. Mm. And do you think when you when you embarked on any of these anthologies? Did you think to yourself, okay, so I'm going to go to the library, I'm going to get out the books, I'm going to leaf through people's stories, or did you close your eyes and think, I remember that one, okay, I remember that one, I remember that one. You make a decision, a sort of pre-research decision based on what had most powerfully seared you. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think what I did a little bit differently with the long gaze back was, yeah, you have your wish list, you have your list of people that you wanted. And again, the, the, a big part of the premise of the long gaze back was that it was a book that was meant to uh, uh, illuminate voices that had been forgotten, uh, to illuminate um, people who sort of eat, very easily fall in between the cracks. And what I also wanted to do, so my experience of looking at anthologies and the one I did in college, the, the Oxford Book of the Irish Show Story, it's a very good collection edited by William Trevor, seven women. Uh, out of 39 stories and um, three men have two stories <laughs> in the book um, a little bit more galling to, to add that in um, and I, I, I so I always saw the same women appearing in anthologies always you could literally it was like a sort of literary blind bingo if I picked up one in the second hand shop and I went okay who'll be in this and it was always you know your, your mother Edna was often in there Somerville and Ross uh, Lavin Bowen, um, all of these writers, all brilliant, all of whom I've anthologized somewhere along the way, um, but always the same people. So I kind of wanted to include a handful of those women by, while also sometimes making a, a decision, which I've also done all the way along, is like not pick the most obvious story. I cheated with Elizabeth Bowen in The Long Days Back and that I did pick The Demon Lover because again, I love spooky stories <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's one of her best stories. So I tried to pick an atypical or a, a story by a writer that hadn't been very heavily anthologized. So things like Her Table Spread, by Bowen is everywhere, you know. Um, Lilacs by Mary Lavin is in practically every mm. Irish anthology you pick up. So I didn't want to do that. I wanted to try and pick a atypical stories. And you know, then in this new book, I have Frank O'Connor's um, A Man of the World, which is a brilliant story. But I didn't want to pick Guests of the Nation or the, the things that everybody knows. So I, I, that's I think that's important to do that as well. Pick some classic work, some familiar work, some non-familiar, some surprising, and some work that people by authors people will, will just not know about. Mm. I mean, it is. It is a very, I mean, to, to put something like this together is uh, you're curating in the sense that you're directing people's attention to what it is you'd like them yeah. to pay attention to. But it's also archaeological because you're finding things that maybe people have known and now neglect or were buried and need to be disinterred and lifted up into the light, um, yeah. which is the, for you, which is more important. The excavatory or the or the um, curatorial. I, I think you can't really have one without the other. To be honest, I think it's it's part of both. Um, and and I do think there is a, a friend said to me that it is like literary archaeology putting together a book like this. I, I remember with um, the glass shore trying to find. I had heard that. Um, Oh God, who's it? Is it Janet McNeil had written stories, short stories. That's he was Janet McNeil, and. The, there are three or four collections in the National Library and of course go in, you can get three books out in an hour, it's a long day. Um, and when I found the stories, they were all stories for children or biblical stories for children and not the kind of thing I wanted to include in the anthology. And then later on, um, finding out that she had published stories in I think the Evening Press and the Belfast Telegraph, which have never been collated in a collection. So that's often another mm. problem when writers never published a full collection of their own, unless they were anthologized, that work very quickly gets lost, goes missing. Um, so for me, it was it, I, I love the idea of bringing writers back because I do think it resurrects them. And I talk an awful lot about Nora Holt, who's in this collection and is in um, The Long Goes Back, who only died in 1984, um, published 26 books, four of those are story collections, uh, and is, is literally forgotten, um, even though she's an incredible writer. And there's been a lot of, in, I think um, Persephone in the UK have one of her collections, There Were No Windows, sorry, one of her novels, There Were No Windows. And the thing about Nora is that she was more banned than John McGahern and and and, and Edna indeed, um, because the work was often quite transgressive, uh, was writing about things that didn't want to be written about. And the story in, in The Art of the Glimpse is a story essentially about sex work. And it was written in the 1930s in Ireland. And I think that's quite staggering to me. Um, it, it comes from a, a collection of the same title, which is impossible to find. And Louise Kennedy, who's a writer originally from the North, um, who's also in this collection, 
found the Nora story in the long case back, kind of fell in love with the story, went off, started researching her and is doing a PhD on Nora, which she's about to hand in. And because a lot of people talked about that story from the long case back, New Island then reissued Cocktail Bar, the collection it came from. I wrote the introduction and, uh, and another Nora book since. And th this is what can happen. Mm. Uh, uh, literally acts of resurrection for a writer they can be brought back from the dead uh you know persephone i think have one of her her there were no windows one of her novels a great novel about dementia actually uh, in print but the rest of it's very hard to find but new island you know saw the response to the book they reissued cocktail bar her collection that i wrote the introduction for and they wrote re reissued another one of the novels which uh, louise wrote the introduction for um so there's now a couple of nora books that are out in the world that wouldn't have been had the long gaze back not sort of literally brought her back from the dead and i think that's the power of the anthology you can give someone a writer um, that they wouldn't necessarily have heard of. I also think there are places to include work by writers that never wrote a whole collection or didn't write many short stories, but might have wrote a couple of great stories that can only really find a place in an anthology because there is no single collection mm. to put them in. So that's what I think, again, that's one of the kind of the, the, the works of the anthology. It's one of the kind of um, the utilities that it can actually do. It can achieve something like that, mm. I think. After The Long Gaze Back, you produced again with New Island, a book called The Glass Shore, an anthology. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, I, I think I, what I said about The Glass Shore is that, you know, books often beget books, and that's precisely what happened with The Glass Shore, and that I did a lot of events for The Long Gaze Back, and it was the One City, One Book for Dublin as well. But in the months after the book came out, I did some events in the North of Ireland, um, and I t there was one in particular in the Lyric in Belfast and afterwards in the q and I, I joke about it being like I am Spartacus um, every single person who's stood up to ask the question at the end said this is a great book and we love this book but where's our book? We don't have a book like this and there had been a brilliant book edited by Ruth Carr in um, 1986 I think um, which wasn't just short stories it was short fiction, memoir, poetry um, but that, again that had been published by a small press and there had not been very much not in terms of an all-female collection um, and again, what happened when The Glass Shore came out is that the female line ended up being um, reprinted as an e-book. Uh, Dawn Sherrod Bado, who's a great academic, um, produced her own collection uh, of, of um, short work and short stories as well. So again, I, I feel all these books are all in conversation. They're all part of the same conversation. They're all links in the same chain. But The Glass Shore existed because, and, and again, I had my reservations because I'm not from the North. and. Uh, I, I thought that maybe somebody from up there or a publisher from up there, but but nobody else was going to do it. So I talked to a lot of people, Northern writers and Northern academics and people at Queen's and yourself, Carlo, and, and asked people, you know, is, is, should I do this? And people just went, well, look, there probably won't be a book if you don't do it. So someone has to do it. And I'd rather there be something like this, a record, where again, you can give an audience a whole load of writers, some they'll know, some they won't, and stories they won't have heard of, or stories they might love and cherish. And that's always uh, the motivation. So uh, they're very much companions, those two books. They're sort of two sides of this, the same coin in a way. Were you surprised by any of the uh, um, Northern Irish or North of Ireland material? Did it strike you as strange or? <laughs> what are you trying to say, Carlo? Um, what surprised me was that uh, I, I remember somebody jokingly saying to me, oh, you're, you're doing a, a story of, you know, a collection of stories from the north of Ireland. Will you not just get like, you know, a load of stories about the Troubles? And I said, I, I don't think so. Um, that's not what I'm expecting at all. And I'm also going to go back a couple of hundred years. So, you know, this, it's, you know, it's pre-1960s. So there's not going to be the Troubles, just different types of, of, of historical issues, maybe. Um, and I didn't think about that. I also didn't think about religion or, or that kind of, I knew I was going to get some stories. So some stories are very much rooted in, in the experience of what's gone on in the North since the 60s. Some are very much about that, but lots of stories are, are not about that. A lot of them are just about things that all stories are about, you know, life and death and relationships and geography and loss and all of those things. So, yeah, I mean, one, the, the start of the book, the older stories, and um, particularly uh, Margaret Barrington, who I've also included in this collection, um, a couple of the early stories are all quite supernatural and strange and, and quite fantastical. And that, that surprised me because they're quite risk taking and that they're quite out there. Um, and I, I, I like that about that, some of the early stories in the book. So that surprised me. Mm. And then we can move on to what we are here to discuss, which is a book that you should not drop on your foot. <laughs> the, well, I, I haven't dropped it on my foot. It's a very beautiful, it's a very beautiful book. Um, yeah. I mean, as an object on top of everything else. And it's a hundred stories. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, how you I, managed I, to get the copyright clearances for all of these, I, my mind 
Yeah, Rebels. well, I, 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 I'll i tell you why it's 100. It's very specific in that the, the publisher in this case, my first three anthologies are with New Island. This is Head of Zeus. Mm -hmm. So it's a UK publisher. And this is something they do. They do 100 story anthologies with the different themes. So they've done uh, they've done a great one on ghost stories. Frank Wynn has an excellent one on translation. Um, Sophie Hanna did a crime one. Victoria Hislop did women. Um, there's all sorts of, they've done a lot of them. So this was the, the, when, when Neil Belton came to me and said, um, we, we want to do an Irish one and we think you should do it. Um, um, and I always have amnesia about the amount of work that's involved. You forget, mm -hmm. literally. And the, and the last ones were, you know, 20, 24 and, or sorry, 26 and, and 30 stories, whereas this is 100. So, but the, the, the thing is, it was, it was presented to me as it was, this is meant to be a sort of a 100 great Irish stories or 100 classic or 100 Irish story, stories you should read. So it, that immediately means you don't have to start commissioning new work because if I'd been doing that I would have needed five years instead of two mm -hmm. to do it and that's that's a big part of the commissioning that takes up a lot of the time commissioning and looking for the work the literal digging around trying to find the actual text because loads of times I didn't and actually what one interesting connection between this book and, and the glass shore is I really really wanted to find uh, sto a story by a writer called Kathleen Coyle um, for the Glass Shore Issues from Derry. Um, again, never published a, a whole collection, but she wrote a lot of stories for an American magazine. Um, so I knew they existed and I have not been able to find those stories. And I've talked to a lot of academics. I had people hunting everywhere for them. And when I was working on this, again, I have, I've always, I have piles of lists. You accumulate a lot of things that you don't use or names you don't use or might go back to. So you already have a bit of a head start on yourself if you've anthologized before. And I was talking to an academic, Geraldine Meany, who was doing some work in the UK. And I said, there, there wouldn't be any chance in that library you're looking at, just, you know, just while you're there. And she had a look and sure enough, um, there was a story by Kathleen Coyle. It's meant to be in something in the National Library that says it's there and it's not there. So I'm wondering if somebody made off of it in Dublin, that is. So, um, so that's the other thing. Sometimes there's a record of something you go to physically find the book, the text, the, the folder and isn't there. So I, so Kathleen Coyle has finally, finally got her into an anthology. She's in this book uh, and she's a, a wonderful writer. I, I wish someone would find the other 40 because then you'd probably get two collections of her stories. Mm. Do you find the whole business of obtaining copyright, obtaining permissions, which, um, is it a finagling, devilish process? I am very lucky to say that somebody in Head of Zeus does that for me but then what I do is if I find and some stories come from older collections or older anthologies that you're photographing when you're allowed to in the National mm. Library and mm. um, you're photographing the story the year the copyright page if it's in an anthology it's who is the original publisher so I, I'm always very careful in terms of cataloging and taking notes because when I, I've learned very terribly that if you don't do that you give yourself twice the work if you have to go mm. back and do it again or the same work you have to retread the same path so uh, yeah I'm, I'm quite consummate about knowing where I find things but somebody else thankfully because I need a long time. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. It can be very difficult to find. And again, there are some stories in this book uh, that I couldn't use, sorry, that are not in this book that I couldn't use because we just couldn't, couldn't find, couldn't clear and decided because some of the, the writers were not that unknown, we would, yeah. we would make the chance, you know, down the road. I mean, it's a, it, the book is 856 pages, I think. It's, yeah. a, I mean, it's an enormous undertaking. When, when you set about organizing your hundred, did you have to re-immerse yourself? Did you have to go back, say, to, I don't know, Joyce? I don't, yes, perhaps, and look and think. Or did you have things that you already knew you wanted to put in? Uh, a bit of both, actually, I'd say. And again, I, you imagine what a, what a hundred can be. And there's two ways of doing that. You can imagine a hundred highly canonical, traditional, what will people think will be in this book? And that's great. So you, so you have that list. And then you have a, how could I shake this up? How could I make this different? And how does it, this book has to look not just like a book in and of itself, but a book that's not like all the other ones. There's no point in me making an anthology that looks like it was published in 1975 or 1995. It has to look like a book that's published now. It has to reflect, as all anthologies do, um, the current climate. Uh, take, they, they can act as a, a way of taking the temperature of what's going on in the world. Um, and I think that's a really important part of the anthology. It must be as current as it can be, uh, you know, when you work on it and then it comes out two years later. But yeah, so what I did is I have a lot of anthologies in the house. I tend to not be able to if I see one somewhere, especially in secondhand shops, I pick them up. I have an awful lot from all over the world. I have themed ones. I have science fiction ones, queer anthologies, Brazilian short stories. I have whatever. So I had a lot of stuff here. So whenever I hit a, a glitch where I couldn't find, or I was waiting for a book through it, it, it the, the Irish libraries of Dublin and the Irish public library systems are incredible for interlibrary loans. They did a lot of that. Pierce Street have a, an Irish um, study section that you can go in and read like the National Library. So I use that a lot and the National Library. So anytime I, I was very kind of... Uh, 
very careful with my time and that when I hit a glitch and I couldn't get to the National Library, I'll go write a stuff at home I can read. I have a lot, you know, I have my three volumes of uh, Elizabeth Bowen stories or my um, Mary Lavin box set that I have. So I would read everything and I did go back and I, I it's, you know, I, I felt that you have to go back and do the work again and again because I've read so many over the years, you remember the things you remember, so you don't have to go back and read stuff. But I, so as somebody said to me this week, there's a lot of information about the short story in your brain and, and cumulatively there is. Yeah. But I still wanted to go back and read and it's always a joy to go back and, you know, somebody said to me last week, it was the, the, right, the, the writer Jimmy McGovern who, who writes for television said to me, do you, did, you, did you pick The Dead? And I said, The Dead's my favourite story. He said, but in a book like this, it's like 60 pages. So that's another um, mm. caveat about that. You can't always fit the story that you want because if they're too long, it's not going to work in an already very massive book like this mm. so it's obviously it's not the dead but yeah so there's an element of, of of deciding what your list of 100 will be and then how you can shake that up so it doesn't look canonical or because again i, do, I think anthologies are of their time but can go out of date very quickly so you have to try and make it as current uh, as you can um, but joyce was always going to be in there always yeah as as was lavin and bowen uh, and and you know frank o'connor and sean o'fuelan and all these these greats um of the form what does the book tell us what what is the temperature reading that it's giving us um i it's telling us i hope um here are a hundred short stories you should read and lots of them you'll know and lots of them you might have studied in school or in college or you'll have heard them in a radio adaptation or you'll know the writer's name even if you haven't read the story but look over here there's a load of other stories by writers that you probably don't know or that are just emerging or that don't necessarily um, don't reflect what you think the Irish story is because for a long time I think we know the Irish girl story looked and, and smelt and tasted a certain way you know it was often parochial it was often rural uh, not in Joyce's case obviously um, you know priests and fields and immigration and alcoholism and many children and families and and terrible love and not being able to have what you wanted and somebody sailing on the ship tomorrow a lot of that um, and some of those stories I love and there's lots of them in this book but there's lots of different ways. And I think the, the, the short story is a very evolving form and it's evolved to, to, to take into account what's also changed in Ireland historically, politically, economically. Um, also, as you know, we have a new Ireland and not everybody living here looks, you know, looks like me or you anymore, which is a really good thing in my view. It's, we were very monotheistic and very monocultural for a long time. And I wanted to sort of um, include some of those voices. Um, there's a lot of writers in the book and I, I think specifically of Emma O'Donoghue and Colm Dubin, who were writing and telling queer and LGBT stories, um, even at a time when it still wasn't necessarily the thing that you talked about very much. And there certainly was, were, you know, going back even pre-column and, and Emma, there, it, it wasn't necessarily the kind of anthology that you, that you saw, you didn't see that kind of work. So I wanted to include, um, and genre I think is a word that I'm really interested in. I find it can be considered a dirty word, that if, if something isn't literary and highbrow and, and um, and again, all those words are awful words. It's like it's good and bad writing, really. Um, but I wanted to sort of look, as I say, my own kind of love of the, of the kind of the gothic, the supernatural, and um, the ghost story. So there's quite a few stories that, and often by people you wouldn't expect, Jennifer Johnston writing a ghost story, Roddy Doyle writing a ghost story uh, in this collection. So, and obviously, again, geographically, I wanted to make sure there was a lot of writers represented from, from the north of Ireland, whether you go six counties or nine counties. So you can put Lima Flaherty and um, Margaret Barrington and people like that in. So. I hope it does seem to be kind of up to date. I mean, one of the story, one of the writers, Chiamaka Enyi Amadi, who's just been long listed for the short story award in the, in the uh, Irish Book Awards because her story is from this book has been nominated. And again, she's been living here and I, I see her as an Irish writer, I see her as whether people call that new Irish or not, but the work is, in, is incredible. And I think I don't want to read the same kind of stories forever. I don't know about you. Um, I, I embrace the newness and I think we need the, a new new forms, not even not even the kind of 10 pages or the chronological story. You know, Wendy mm. Erskine's story is, is written in fragments, 77 fragments to be exact. Mm. And somebody like that is pushing the shape and form and elasticity of the short story. I think um, I, that's another thing I like about the form. It's, it's like the essay, very bendy. You can do a lot with it. Mm. Why is it? Well, this is a question in two parts. Why is the short story associated with Ireland? And why is the short story, argue, why do people say it's a peculiar, it's something that people in Ireland have a peculiar talent for? 
Um, there's probably lots of theories. I think we've, we've always been a land of writers and scribes. You know, if you're going back to the right back to the Book of Kells, and um, we've been writing things down and telling stories, even if they're biblical ones. In that sense, um, a few years ago, when I used to work in TV, I interviewed uh, the the Maori writer uh, Uti Imahara, uh, who wrote Whale Rider. People will probably know him for, and we had a long conversation. And he said, I, I think the Maori are like the Irish. You know, a small a group of people who had their own language or in, but lived in a very storytelling folkloric oral culture and he said I'm, I'm convinced that's why not just that we're storytellers and writers but that we're short storytellers and writers because when you think about it the idea of going kaleeing and storytelling and moving from house to house which used to happen a lot in Ireland you had to keep the whole story in your head so you weren't going to do that with a novel but you could probably do it with something that took you 20 minutes to tell um, and I think we're a very verbal culture I think we're the kind of culture you know who talk to everybody talk to people at the bus stop or used to, or I still do. Um, I think we're just, we're a very extrovert, um, communicative. Uh, I think we're also a culture that revels in language. This, you know, this, you can tell somebody that you went to the shop for milk and the, or you can make that story last 10 minutes if you like. And I think that's just part of our culture is that we're, we're, we're verbal, we're expressive and we, we kind of really glory in language. And I think that does come from our Hiberno-English culture. The fact that we, the, the duality in the language, the split in the language, the moving away mm. from you know, a, a coin shot squalia. Um, so I think that's a big part of it too. I've sometimes wondered whether the short story isn't the perfect form for covering lies and deception. Oh, tell me more. That's an interesting I, I, I think, you know, two, three, four, five thousand words is a perfect word vessel for carrying the anatomization, the excavation of deception and lies um, and um, and I think that I mean a lot of the stories in in all of the collections concern that the other thing we were talking about what does an anthology do for one um, obviously one wants to read something that isn't typical one wants to be surprised it's 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 you're being given nourishment in an unexpected order and nourishment, you have stories butted up against each other, which you, therefore you get surprising conjunctions. So it kind of stirs you up and this, this um, you know, this is a rare pleasure. But also reading, um, reading The Art of the Glimpse, I was very surprised suddenly to encounter things that I'd forgotten. Or it's not that I'd forgotten them, I, I, they hadn't gone away. They were My sort God. of... Well, like cancer, the McCabe story about sectarianism, which is set in the 70s yep. or the 80s. But, you know, as if you live here in where I live in northern or the north of Ireland, you know, um, the war may be over. But um, I mean, hostilities have ceased, but this does not mean amity. And I suddenly I was reading the McCabe story and I thought, oh, God, I remember all this. Jeepers, it's so, and yet I'd forgotten it as well. Yeah. I kind of put it out of my mind. And I thought, wow, that's incredible. I think what, what the, the short story is also good, good. And this, reserve, this refers back to the title, which is The Art of the Glimpse, which is what William Trevor, how William Trevor, who's in the book, described another writer in the book, um, Margaret Barrington. He described the, her skill for the short story as The Art of the Glimpse. And that's what a short story can also do. It can it's very reactive form. So you could, if something, if you decided that you wanted to write a short story about Donald Trump very recently saying that he wouldn't necessarily agree to leaving the White House if he didn't get the, the votes that he needed to stay, you could write a short story about that today. If you wrote a novel and it took you three years, it wouldn't be so fresh, whatever. So mm. that's another thing. It's a very reactive form. It's often used for, for very political reasons, I think, um, to, to uh, and I think that that's what cancer actually does, that story. And, and the weird thing about cancer, and I think, again, when you just mentioned there, and it's, I don't know if what you were alluding to, but there are lots of moments in the book where two stories that are several pages or, or hundreds of pages apart in the book are often extremely alike. And I didn't realise it until the book was put together or other people who've started reading the book have said it to me. And I, I, what I find about the McCabe story, there is something about that going back in time, as you said, you almost have a shudder reading that story. And I was a lot younger. I, I was alive in the 70s. I remember what the news and the stories of booby traps and soldiers. And it's very chilling to read it. And you kind of read it with those almost kind of sense of, I'm glad it's not like that anymore. As you say, it isn't still perfect. There's still a lot of healing and trauma and recovery to be done, but there, there, there aren't the soldiers on the street, you know, there aren't the checkpoints. Mm. Um, and I find that the Bernard McClaverty story 
the two of them are very similar. I mm. think the after walking the dog, which mm. is a superb story. I think were you reading that as well? Mm. Yeah. 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 It's, they... it's funny. There's nothing. There's nothing comic about trauma and difficult situations. And yet when you read, the, it's, a, it's about a man who stopped with his dog and, and two lads pull up in the car and go get into the car. You know, they're kind of be, being disappeared. He didn't know what was going to happen. But the dog has to go with them. And there's loads of story moments in a story, which is a story of pure terror because the man doesn't know if they're, they're threatening to kill him. He's been told, if you don't do this, I'll kill you. If you do that, I'll kill you. And yet there's loads of moments in the story that are incredibly comic. And that's not to suggest anything about the Troubles is comic at all. It isn't. But it's the, the Beckettian thing of, you know, the, the graveside and the banana skin, you know, these two weird kind of light and dark things so working so well together in the one story. And that's a kind of, that's the skill of, McCla of, of Bernard McClafty to be able to make that very frightening, very terrifying story have little moments where you are actually laughing a little bit because they're asking his name to figure out where he's come from. They're asking to see the alphabet uh, to see if he says H or H. Yeah. If they can figure out if he's a Protestant or, and they actually eventually just go, tell us, are you Protestant or Catholic? Um, but it's, it's funny, but terrifying, you know, and again, we're, we're not at that point anymore, thankfully in the North. What's so interesting about the Bernard McClavity story is that um, you never know who the what the what the confessional orientation of the two men who are out looking for someone to kill? Yeah, they, they they have to produce a body, and there's something about the way that, that that story conjures up a kind of not knowing, really. You're not really able to fix what's going on, and you couldn't. I mean, you're absolutely right. You couldn't make a novel about that. No. But by goodness, you can do that. You can do a three thousand word story that shows what it's like to be bewildered because you have no idea what's going on. Um, I, I think I, I've mentioned before as well that Philip Hensher has edited the Penguin book of the, of the British short story and he made a really interesting point in the introduction to that as well that he said people like Dickens and Somerset Maugham apart from the fact that they were getting often the equivalent of a doctor's salary in the 1920s for one short story often used the short story as a place where they could try all their weird stuff out so they'd, they'd write their sci-fi or their alien planet stuff or their mm. you know um, creepy gothic or their fantasy or whatever it was and it was it was a bit of a, so it can be a place of experimentation and risk taking because you know Dickens might publisher might just go there's no way I'm going to publish your weird sci-fi book but you know knock yourself out if you want to submit a short story to the strand or whatever it is and that's another thing that he said that you find often writers will take a break from their own uh canon their own usual concerns and themes and go off and try something a bit more unusual with the short story so again i tried to find some of those, those kind of stories for, for this kind of book and i like the idea that it can be a place where you, you wouldn't do it anywhere else but you might do it in the short story and that makes it an exciting form for me as well for that reason why are you so attracted to um the supernatural I don't know. I just I, that I, is I, a I, definite recurring thing. Yeah, there's there's there is a lot of it in here, and there is a lot in the glass shore as well. I maybe it's just going back to reading all those uh, uh, ghostly tales and Alfred Hitchcock. And again, I'm I'm not mad on horror films as it is. It's more that I like, and I always like the kind of psychological, the things that you don't necessarily know. I don't like slasher or gore, but I like mm. the things that kind of will make will leave you thinking, and you just go, well, well, I don't actually know what happened. And I I write in constellations about my great grandmother and my grandmother are very psychic and, and there's a sort of psychic scene in the matrilineal side of my family and I'm interested in that stuff even though I'm a completely rationalist and scientific person I can't explain some things that have happened um but I, I the reason I, I like it is because they're so multifaceted and open-ended that I'll read something and you'll read something and we might completely have a different um interpretation of what that story is uh, the, the brilliant demon lover by Elizabeth Bowen that's in the long days back I've taught that with students and you wouldn't believe the different responses to the end you know people who think a whole, it's about the war, it's madness, it's post-traumatic, you know, uh, PTSD, um, she's mad. Um, it is a ghost, the ghost has abducted her. Like this, oh, there's a whole array. And I like that idea that you can have a multiple different type, type of responses and interpretations of a ghost story and a supernatural story. You can't really do that with the Bernard McClafferty or, or with Cancer by Eugene McCabe, but you can do it with supernatural stories. So mm. maybe that's why I like it. It's the multiplicity of it. Are you, um, or were you ever in the process of putting the anthology together, impatient with the well-made story. Did you find yourself thinking, mm, here we go, first an introduction, set the scene, here's the characters, tick them off, here's their subtext. Whereas a story like Wendy Erskine's story yeah. is, is, is 77 short snippets about a Sid Barrett-esque yeah. um, uh, savant genius pop star catastrophe, completely different to anything else. And I think 
an outstanding story. But I just wondered whether I asked yeah. that question because Constellations is clearly the, um, the the creation of a modern intelligence. You know, it's it's um, you're gathering things together. It's essayistic. Mm -hmm. It's impressionistic. You not necessarily you're not ruthlessly chronological. You move around. Um, you bring all sorts of different things in. You're quite happy to stop narrating something about yourself and talk about um, a painter or something in history. And then, you know, it's got many different strands all ingeniously knitted together, but it's, yeah. it's modern. Whereas a lot of, you know, the Irish story is not many strands knitted together. It's quite, you know, did yeah. you get irritated? <laughs> No, I wouldn't say irritated because, I, again, I, I think there's, there has to be scope, especially if you love and are as committed to the short story as I am, to, to embrace the, the, the variety of it. And again, I love a small, elegiac William Trevor story as much as the next man or woman. Uh, it's the same with Frank O'Connor or Lima Flaherty, even though Lima Flaherty's story is, is insane. It's also set in a hospital, which is another reason why I picked it, a, a kind of crazy comic story in a hospital. And you don't get many of them. But I, I think, yeah, I know what you mean. And I, I, one thing that I, 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 I'm quite deliberate about is including not just the canonical well-known writers that you'll know from the past, but also people like, you know, uh, Jane Barlow or Elizabeth Cullinan that people won't know. And they'll think that they're quiet, typical Irish stories. And there's nothing wrong with those stories. And I feel like there has been a move in the last 10, 20 years towards a certain type of story, often veering towards the comic and um, the very chatty um, talky kind of story, a lot of dialogue. Um, yeah. and, 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 and there's a lot of those stories in here too by some of those brilliant writers. But there's nothing wrong with thinking that, that you know, Louise Kennedy, for example, said to me, I read the Bernard McClaffrey, or the, I read the Bernard, Benedict Kiley story, and she said it was so sinister and creepy, and that was what I, I was expecting. And again, I think people make assumptions about what kind of writer Ben Kiley is and was, and I'm always a, a huge fan of his work. It's so musical, there's such a musicality to him, but that's a really sinister story in the book. And, she, and Louise said, I'd read three or four stories about terrible men in a row in the book, and they were all very good, but very different. So I think we have to be very careful not to go, I only like the new kind of stories that are being published in all the literary journals, all of which are great, many appear in this book, but you have to not forget, you have to not have a kind of amnesia about the fact that it was okay to write a beautiful story about a sad elderly man who lived on a farm and that's what the story is about, because those stories have meaning, they resonate, they're universal as well, um, and some of them are totally unforgettable. So I, I, I'm a fan of both, and I don't mind the start, middle and end, and I don't start, mind a story that is very intrinsically and, and traditionally thematically Irish, that's fine by me as well. But it's important to me that the book has, has both and it does, mm. but so maybe some readers will be impatient going, oh, I don't want this crusty old story from the 1920s about a farm. I want, some, I want somebody to make me laugh for 10 pages. And that's, that's okay too. Um, Cause not everybody likes a hundred stories in a hundred story anthology. And that's, I expect nothing less. You just mentioned Elizabeth Cullinan. Yeah. That's how she wrote a story called A Swim. I was very struck by that story. Um, you also mentioned in the biographical introduction that she was, um, she used to type up Mr. Updike, that's John Updike's stories. I mean, yeah. oh my goodness me, um, that was a labour. Um, <laughs> well, well, I mean, you know, his punctuation is so fiendish. Yeah. Um, how did you come across Elizabeth Cullinan? She's remarkable. Yeah, she, again, I, I, whenever I'm embarking on this work, and one thing I say all the time is that, Lots of writers don't die uh, on the page because of academics and academics and students and PhD students and professors teaching work by writers um, helps to keep them alive. And I've, I always I have, a lot, I have a network of academics I talk to. We chat about short stories anyway, even when I'm not working on this. So it was an academic who suggested Elizabeth Cullinan to me and I, I immediately dove into what I can find. There are only two collections, a few novels and um, published a lot of stories in The New Yorker in the 1970s and only died earlier this year. Um, the interesting thing about that story, it's, it's about a, a day trip to house with a man. It's about a date. It's about a swim. It's about a not very good date. Um, no, it's a man, terrible date. The man in the story is another writer in the book. Um, but I won't tell you who it is. You'd probably have to try and figure it out yourself. So, so there's a writer that features twice in this book, once in his own right and once in Elizabeth Cullen's, uh, Cullinan's story as, as her bad date. So, but it's a wonderful story. And again, that's a traditional start at the start, but it's, again, it's the creeping sense of, of, of dread and the fact that you wanted to work for them and you feel like it's not, and you already feel at the start that it's not going to, but it's the way she sort of tells the story and tries to imagine and superimpose her own kind of feelings onto the situation, but while being very aware of his, uh, not 
not, not, not charitableness, that's not the word, that he, he just, he can't give her what she needs. And, and she kind of knows that anyway, but it doesn't stop her not going to hope that there'd be no story. Mm. But it's a very, yeah, it's a very kind of melancholic and, and very atmospheric story. And I felt I was wandering around Houth while I read it. They're not going to make each other happy. No, and, no. and I didn't even real life they didn't either. <laughs> no. So. Um, it's like a little short Bergman film, um, yeah. sear searing and bleak. Maybe, yeah. maybe a prize, a money prize should be offered to uh, people to identify. <laughs> Are you going to um, to identify the writer in a swim? Are you um, are you done with anthologization? Are you worn out by it? Is it wrung you dry? In terms of the Irish short story, for for now, I will say yes. What I will tell you is that um, I am working on another anthology that's not fiction. It's also not. It's not. Um, it has a very specific theme. Put it that way. And I'm a co-editor with somebody that I really admire who isn't a writer. And um, that's supposed to be coming out in 2022. So I'm working a bit on that. I have nearly everybody that we want to have in it, but it's still not quite there. Um, and I have to contribute something myself to it. So that's, that will be an anthology technique, but not this kind of anthology. So yeah, after that, no, I, I, but it's, it's like, it's like childbirth, Carly. You kind of, you forget it. Yes, and then I you know. Go, yeah, you know, like, yeah. there's was, was no bother at all. And then you go back to it and go, oh God, I forgot how much work this was. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, I, so I will say for now, no. Oh, and also, you know, because I, I, I've edited so many, I, I, I want someone else to do it. So I can have the joy of sitting down with a glass of wine and reading it and not have to do all the work. And also because every anthologist has their own biases and subjectivity and taste. So I'd like someone else to kind of shape a book and it would be very different to mine probably. And I, I, I love that idea of seeing another book. So unless you want to do it, Carlo, I mean, you've got a lot of knowledge. You've read an awful lot. <laughs> um, uh, I have, yes. Yes, I, of course I will. I shall, I, shall, I shall put it in the diary for next week. That's legally um, binding now. You've said it, so it's legally binding. We've been talking about, we've been talking for an hour. Uh, we've been talking about the art of a glimpse and um, the guest is Sinead Gleeson. And those of you who are listening to this podcast, I would suggest that you buy several copies for Christmas. I mean, it is a really, really, really remarkable book. Um, it's, it's, kind of, it's like it's, it's so big. heavy it's, it's yeah. heavy and it's got a lovely ribbon but it's the kind of thing that you know I, we're, we're all living as we know through terrible strange and anxious times and if the weather's going to turn and it's going to get colder it is the thing that might get you through the winter if you read a couple every day it, and it'll keep you going um and, and that's the joy of an anthology you don't have to like everything but you'll have only spent 10 pages in one writer's company and then you're on to the next thing and you can literally go from you know hot and a bad day with elizabeth cullen and on to you know uh, living in, in a caravan in, um, in Gort, as, as mm. Kevin Barry's brilliant story, The Girls and the Dogs, does. So you, 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 if they transport you, you can be t different times, geographic places, you can be in relationships, you can be in war situations, you can be in all sorts of places. And that's what I love, the fact that you, ne you don't know what you're going to get when you end one story and flip over to the next page. That's the, one of the things I love about them, the surprise element. I think we should also emphasise that this is a book with very big, generous gullies. So when you turn the page, you yeah. can see all the words. I know that sounds like what a Daily Telegraph reader <laughs> who wears trousers with elasticated waistbands would say, but um, it is true. You know, it, 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 it's, it's an object which has been created intelligently and is a pleasure to read, both because of the way it is made and because of the content you've selected. Yeah, Head of Zeus have done a, a beautiful job and the, the cover is uh, a guy called Owen Gent who did the who's, who did the cover of Donal Ryan's latest novel actually as well. He's a beautiful illustrator. So it's, it's a lovely tactile object and I, I am, if you know, if, I, if I'm a modern reader in one way, I don't own a Kindle. I don't want to read things online. I like spines. I like secondhand bookshops. I like putting my bookmark in. I, I don't like to read digitally unless I have to for work for, with PDFs, but otherwise I will I'll resist. I'll rage against the dying of the light, Carla, when it comes to a physical book. So this is the thing, as you say, you can sit down and read a couple a day. You can skip, you can go back and forth. You don't have to read it in the way I've laid it out alphabetically, but you can read it whatever way you like. Most of the work was done by you, Sinead Gleeson. Thank you very, 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 very much. Thank you, Carlo. Thanks to the, the London Irish Arts Centre.